heaven. What a tremendous privilege it is to worship He who made heavens and earth and sent His Son to die for us so that we could live forever. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and enjoying this privilege with us as we've sang songs to His matchless name and glorified Him. And we've listened to a beautiful psalm read to us and to Doug's powerful prayer as we went right before the throne of God. What a privilege it is to worship our awesome God. Now I'd like to look for a while into Scripture with you at a lesson which I hope will be one that uh, you'll pay some attention to, think about how it applies to your life, realize that it probably does, and uh, make corrections and betterment accordingly. Uh, the lesson this evening is entitled Living in Laodicea. And you might say to yourself, well, I don't live in Laodicea. Well, I think maybe by the time we finish with the lesson tonight, you may see that you do. <laughs> and uh, some of the things that they were facing in Laodicea, the Christians had to deal with there, are some of the very things that, that we face today in uh, our society here in the United States as Christians. If I start talking about Laodicea, the first thing everybody would want to do, if you're a Bible student at all, probably is turn to Revelation, the third chapter. But I'm going to pull the old switcheroo on you and start with uh, Colossians chapter 2 tonight, which I think would be the last place maybe some would think about going. Uh, the city of Laodicea is actually mentioned four times in the book of Colossae, Colossians, I should say. It was a town that was closely associated with, with Colossae, and so it's mentioned by name four times in this book. And so in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. And then when you turn over to chapter 4, Paul's talking about Epaphras, who is, he says in verse 12, one of you, a bondservant of Christ, he greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, Demas greets you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So Laodicea is mentioned a lot in the epistle that Paul wrote to the Colossians. And as I said, Colossae and Laodicea were very close, both geographically and culturally. Uh, they were about 10 miles apart. And the city of Hierapolis, which is also mentioned here, was about seven miles from Laodicea. And this formed a, a triangle, if you will, in central, uh, what is now Turkey, what we call in Bible times, Asia. Um, and uh, a, a very prosperous region of the world at that time. Both Colossae and Laodicea were decimated by an earthquake that occurred in 60 AD, which is about the time that Paul is writing to the Colossians. This earthquake is well documented in history, as well as the effects that it had on these towns. Laodicea was virtually leveled. But it was such a wealthy place that the citizens determined to rebuild it and make it better than it was. Rome offered them assistance, but they declined. They basically said, you know, federal government, stay out of our backyard, we'll do this ourselves. They were wealthy enough to accomplish that. And so they did rebuild their city, a magnificent city for its day, uh, from their own funds. It took some time to do that. Archaeologists tell us that the public buildings, the large public buildings of Laodicea were not fully restored for about 30 years. So from the time of 60 AD to the time of 90 AD, it took to really rebuild uh, the city to its great prominence. Uh, archaeologists have also discovered that uh, Laodicea did have a bit of a hard time financially during this period right after the earthquake. Um, while a lot of coins were minted there prior to 60 AD, uh, there got to be much few, many, uh, a good bit fewer uh, 
minting of coins, if you will, coin production in Laodicea from the years from 60 to 79 AD. That is also something that's uh, documented pretty well in history and through archaeological digs. Laodicea was located on a high plateau in a mountain region, and it was uh, very well defensed. It was a good position to be in militarily. Um, besides its wealth uh, and its natural defenses, probably the only drawback to living in Laodicea was that the water supply was no good. In fact, it was just about non-existent. Colossae had good cold water, mountain springs. In fact, Colossae was a mountain town. And so there was cold water that was piped from Colossae 10 miles away to Laodicea. Uh, but by the time it got there, it was often lukewarm. Hierapolis, on the other hand, had hot mineral springs, still has hot mineral springs where people go to, to, to bathe and, and for the medicinal benefits of all of that. Um, and Hierapolis also piped water to Laodicea. It was very hot when it came out of the ground at Hierapolis. But by the time it got to Laodicea, it also was lukewarm. And besides being lukewarm, it was mineral water and just tasted absolutely awful. Uh, so those were the uh, water supplies, if you will, that you had in Laodicea. And either way you went, you either had lukewarm mineral water, which was awful to drink, but pretty good to bathe in, or you had uh, lukewarm mountain water, which was good to drink, but not really all that cold. So that was the situation geographically. The city of Laodicea, was famous for three things in the first century. It was known for its finances, which I've already mentioned. It was a center of banking and finance and the minting of coins. And it was known throughout the Roman Empire in the first century for its wealth and its financial power. Again, I want you to draw in your mind similarities between how it must have been to be a citizen of Laodicea, their wealth and their prominence, and what it is to be a citizen of the United States today. And I think that you'll see in many ways we are living in Laodicea. We're living in a place where we're pretty secure militarily, where our financial institutions and situation is the envy of all the world. The dollar is still yet the standard of financial stability all the way around the world. Some of you may be interested to know, some of you may have mentioned this too. Uh, Zimbabwe's currency collapsed uh, a few years ago. There was a great financial economic crisis there. They don't have their own currency anymore. But like a number of other countries throughout the world, they just use the US dollar. Uh, the US dollar is what's used there in many places. You don't have to change money to go to Zimbabwe because it's all in dollars. We can relate to the Laodiceans whose finances were top notch in the world. It was a place of fashion. Laodicea was renowned for a soft black wool that was produced there. The wool was considered actually a luxury item and was sought after for both clothing and for rugs. It was also considered a a fashion center of the day, kind of like a Paris where the latest fashions were exhibited and they set the trends for fashion, especially in this sector of the Roman Empire. The newest styles always appeared first in Laodicea. And then it was a place known for pharmaceuticals. There was, at the time in the first century, a famous medical school in Laodicea that produced a small tablet that was sold throughout the empire. When if you crushed this tablet and mixed it up and formed a paste with it, it could be put on the eyes to uh, alleviate a number of eye problems. And so you have these three things that Laodicea is known for. Finances, fashion, pharmaceuticals. Again, a lot like our country today. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, and by extension to the Laodiceans. Laodicea was headed toward an appreciation of the true spiritual riches that they might have in Christ. 
I want you to go back now and look at Colossians chapter 2 with me again and see what Paul writes to these people. He's writing again around 60 AD, give or take. And he expresses his expectation that the Laodiceans would, would gain the true riches that are in Christ. He says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Please notice the language that Paul uses. The metaphor that he uses twice is one of riches. He desires and expects for the Colossians and the Laodiceans to gain a knowledge and appreciation for all the riches of the full assurance of understanding of the mystery of God in verse 2. And in verse 3, he talks about in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. So here is a city that had just been or would soon be decimated by an earthquake. Paul is encouraging these people to seek after the true riches that are in Christ, to seek spiritual riches. Now you'll note the contrast then for those who are familiar with what John writes sometime later in Revelation chapter 3, and now we'll go there. For in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, John says to the Laodiceans on behalf of Christ, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is my firm belief and Part of that belief is based on the contrast that we're looking at here. That the book of Revelation was written some good time after the book of Colossians. I know there are those that believe in an early date for Revelation that maybe it was written 65, 66 AD. I just don't think that's tenable at all. But one of the reasons for that is I see a huge difference between what Paul writes to the Colossians in 60 AD and what John writes to them probably writing from 90 to 95 A.D., some three decades later. Can you see the difference? Can you see the hopefulness that Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2 of, of, the, of the Laodiceans coming to understand what true riches really were? And then in Revelation chapter 3, that was lost. They had completely swallowed materialism. And they were so involved in having things and the possessing of things that they had forgotten what the true spiritual riches even were. And here's a, here's a, a story of a church, really, that over a brief few decades, maybe three decades, went from one who might be able to appreciate the treasures that we have in Christ one that had succumbed to the mammon of this world. There are those who are sitting in this room who can tell stories of working in the cotton fields, who remember what it was to be poor, to be dirt poor, and possibly not even know where your next meal was coming. To where we sit right now, just a few decades later, now with the temptations, the problems of materialism that our fathers couldn't have dreamt of. And I say to you that we're living in Laodicea. But our attitudes don't have to be their attitudes. We'll see as we wind up the lesson in a little while that Jesus calls on the Laodiceans to repent. To give up their materialism. And to seek after the true riches in a relationship with Jesus Christ.
the challenge for Christians was to distinguish between material wealth and security and the true riches and security that only Christ can provide. And so, with this background in mind, let's look at the verses in Revelation chapter 3 and see how that they are particularly relevant to our day in a time when I believe we have many who call themselves Christians who have the Laodicean mentality and many are living in Laodicea. John writes to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans Right, these things, says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as i love i rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent the problems in laodicea were threefold it was a problem of possession who was in charge who had ownership and what did they have ownership of? There's an, an interesting thing. I think it's, it's, it's more than just something to notice in passing. And maybe it hasn't uh, come to your notice before, but I want to point it out to you. When this church is addressed, they're addressed as the church of the Laodiceans. Now that's pretty interesting, and that's the way it reads in the original language, in the Greek as well. That's a very good rendition. When you go back and look at the other six churches of the seven churches of Asia, in Revelation 2 and verse 1, the New King James says, the angel of the church of Ephesus. But really, the better translation, the Greek word is uh, epsilon nu, in, our, equal to our in. So it's really... Uh, to the angel of the church in Ephesus would be the best translation, and several of the newer translations translate it that way. The angel of the church in Ephesus. And all the other trans all the other churches are addressed in that way. The angel of the church in Smyrna, verse 8. The angel of the church in Pergamos, verse 12. The angel of the church in Thyatira, verse 18. And then in chapter 3 and verse 1, the angel of the church in Sardis. In chapter 3 and verse 7, the angel of the church in Philadelphia. So the churches of Christ, his candlesticks, were located in these cities. But that's not how Laodicea is addressed. Laodicea is addressed as the church of the Laodiceans. And that's the most accurate rendering both, I think, uh, well, from the original language. That's, that's an extremely accurate rendering. If you study the seven churches of Asia, and this isn't the study of those churches, but I can guarantee you that there are very tight parallels and comparisons that are made between the seven churches. There is precise language that is used in comparing them. In fact, there are a number of different phrases that are used exactly the same way in talking to each of the seven churches. The language chosen by the Holy Spirit is very, very precise. It always is, but especially in this section of Scripture in making these comparisons. And so it seems to me that it's more than just chance or happenstance that the church at Laodicea is addressed as the church of the Laodiceans. That suggests to me one of two things. Either the emphasis is that this church is composed of people who would identify themselves first and foremost as Laodiceans. That, that concept, I think we can understand, where somebody is so proud of their city or of their culture that, you know, I am an American first, or I am an Athenian first. And 
Laodicea was that kind of place where people were proud to be citizens of Laodicea. They were boastful of their possessions, of their wealth, of their military might, of their learning. And so to say, I am a Laodicean first, that may be what's indicated here when they're described as the church of the Laodiceans instead of saints at Laodicea or the church at Laodicea. The other possibility in describing them in this way might be that they viewed the church as their possession. You ever had that? You've had that discussion with people, haven't you? And they'll say, you know, well, at my church, and you'll say, you know what, you don't have a church. <laughs> I know sometimes you can use the phrase my church and not mean, you know, that you own the church. You're just a part of it. That's that's a legitimate way. And people, when they say that, they, they probably don't mean what it sounds like when they say that. But you've probably corrected people or been privy to discussions where somebody's been corrected for, for calling it my church. And I wonder if that's not part of this as well that they saw this as, as something that belonged to them. In either case, and I don't want to draw too, too much from that, but I think there is something to it. In, in either case, the problem was one of possession. Jesus owns the church. Jesus purchased it with his own blood. The elders of Ephesus were told to shepherd that flock which Jesus purchased with his own blood. He built his church. The church universally and locally exists for his glory. We are here for him and for him alone. And our duty is to preach him and praise him, promote him, and publish him. It's not your church, it's not my church, it's his. He is the possessor of it. He is the head of it. He is its founder. And he is its king. No man or group of men, no congregation, is qualified to take his place as the owner of his church. The Laodiceans, I feel confident that they possessed all things that they needed, including the church itself. And so their problem was not just one of possession, it was one of perception. They didn't understand what was truly valuable. As I mentioned, water from the hot springs at Hierapolis was piped to Laodicea. But by the time it got there through the aqueducts, it was no longer hot, it was just lukewarm. The tepid, lukewarm, distasteful water was something that was familiar to the people of Laodicea. And Jesus tell, tells them that they had become just like that distasteful water. They would lost their passion for the things of the Lord. And that was a problem. In fact, it's the very meaning of what it is to be lukewarm, isn't it? They were indifferent toward spiritual things, toward the riches that are in Christ. Things like redemption, a spiritual relationship with God and with one another, the Word of God, the condition of lost people around them who they should have been evangelizing with fervency. These folks were not burning with passion for Jesus. They weren't totally dead. They weren't cold. They were somewhere in between. And again, this is the condition of a lot of churches, I think, in our country. People are going through the motions, but there's no real burning passion for the things of the Lord. We're too caught up in what we have, in what we possess, in what we can enjoy in the way of pleasure. The average church of today is a study in apathy. We're not exactly dead. We're praying and we're preaching and we're singing, but we're not on fire either. 
There's no excitement or passion about whom we serve. About what we're hearing and what we're studying and what we're learning and what we're doing. People may enter the assembly. They take their seat, they fold their arms. They proceed to judge the quality of the singing and of the preaching and their opinions and their meager participation are all they go home with. Let me just say this and then I'll move on. There are some things about which you cannot be indifferent. Indifference and apathy are not options when it comes to Jesus Christ. Either he is everything or you make him sick. And those are the choices. When the people in Laodicea looked at themselves, they saw a perfect church. I want you to think about that. They had everything. They didn't need anything. And how different, how different are we than them? Look at us and look at what we have. We're doing fine, and we have need of nothing. I pray that we never reach that place. I pray that that's not our attitude. I don't believe that it is, but I believe we need to be warned against it because we are living in Laodicea. The prescription for Laodicea is found in verse 18 that we read. They needed to go to the Lord and buy from him, obtain from him, spiritual values remember what paul had said back in colossians 2 you need to understand that the real riches are in knowing god the hidden treasures are in the wisdom and knowledge of god and if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon if you don't really understand what material wealth is all about and what it's good for and what it can be used for and if you haven't used it for something good in this world who's going to commit to you the true riches that's the question that jesus asked in luke 16 and verse 11. if you don't understand the place of material wealth you'll never get the place of spiritual wealth and the laodiceans didn't get it as we said, the problem was one of perception. They needed to alter their values, their whole value system, what was most important in life. They needed spiritual values. They needed spiritual vestments, garments, if you will. Jesus says, you need the white robe. You don't realize that you're poor and blind and naked, and, and I want to give you a white robe so that you can clothe yourself. He would clothe them in robes of righteousness and they would be no longer exposed in the sight of God. In Revelation 19 and verse 8, much later on, John writes about the bride of Christ. To her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Here are the garments that we need to be wearing as Christians, righteous acts, doing good, doing the will of God from day to day. It's not a focus on the outward apparel. This world is not, uh, you know, all about a fashion show, physically speaking. Peter will tell ladies in 1 Peter chapter 3, don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging hair, wearing gold, putting on a fine apparel. He says, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Here are spiritual garments that we need to value and that God values, that are precious to Him. Inner qualities of goodness, and outer deeds of righteousness. 
This is what God sees as beautiful garments. This is what he wants to give us. It's what he wanted to give them. And they needed spiritual vision. The Lord invited the Laodiceans to come to him so that he could restore their spiritual vision. Very ironic. Here was the place renowned for that medicine that they put on the eyes so that people could see. And he tells them, you're blind and you need to come to me for the medicine so that you can see. The Lord sent the gospel into the, this world through the mediation of people like the Apostle Paul in Acts 26 and verse 18. The purpose of it was to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those that are sanctified. Here were people so satisfied with themselves who needed the Lord and who needed what the Lord had to offer. So the Lord says, be zealous and repent. The word zealous is an interesting word study. It literally means to come to a boil. It's quite a word choice in this context in Revelation 3, where Jesus had just charged them with being lukewarm. And he said, you need to come to a boil. Be zealous and repent. If Laodicea were to repent, they would come alive to the Lord and to his presence among them. They'd be moved not only by the story of the cross, but by the plight of lost sinners all around them. We need to hear the Lord's voice today and be zealous and repent. We're living in a world full of blessings, material blessings. We need to remember where they come from. We need to remember what they're for, to use, to gain eternal life. And we need to remember what the real riches are and be on fire for those. Thank you for your good attention tonight. I hope you'll give very thoughtful consideration to what we've talked about. There's one here this evening who realizes that your life is lukewarm before the Lord. This sickens him. And I don't think that's what you want to do with your life. Consider your situation. Repent if you need to. Please come while we stand and while we sing.